the end of the world in Bible prophecy. Again, we're going to see some beautiful things here. And I, again, I love, this, I love this message. And we're going to see a number of things. But I want to bring in our prophecy chart again. And many of you have seen this chart. Many of you have it. Some haven't. But this is a prophecy chart, a chart of time. Uh, everything you see, all of these events you see are prophecies that are leading us to an eternal state with God, uh, an eternal place with our God. And again, we're going to cover this, go through this chart today. It's going to help you to understand where we are in prophecy. But I'm a topical teacher, so I'm going to give you four topics we're going to look at. Uh, first, we're going to see what uh, the end of the world as they see it. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to give you the end of the world as Hollywood sees it. And then we're going to also look at what should be our response as Christians to the end of the world message. What, how should we react and relate to the end time message? Then I'm going to define what is Bible prophecy? What is this message of the end times? What is it all about? And then last, I'm going to give you an overview of the end of the world in Bible prophecy. And I love that because what I'm going to do, I'm just going to refresh your hearts. Again, Prophecy 101. I'm going to take you through and give you an overview of the end times. And we're going to see some amazing things today. But I want to start with this picture. Look at this picture. This is how the world thinks of the end of the world. When you think of the end of the world, uh, uh, they think in their mind that the world is going to just be destroyed. This great, uh, uh, another comet is going to hit us or some planet is going to crash into us. Uh, especially when you read verses like this. This is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 10. Peter said this. He said, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now, saints, if we just stopped at that one verse, it looks pretty bad for planet earth. But thank God uh, there are other verses in Peter where he says, Peter says, we look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. God is going to renovate this current world that we know. There is coming a fire baptism of planet Earth. But when the fire is, uh, 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 cleanses and we step on the new Earth, it's going to be a beautiful world. And we're going to see that as we go forward this morning. Uh, the end of the world is not futility. It's going to be beautiful for the redeemer. We're going to see that as we go forward. So let's first look at the end of the world as they see it. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at a few topics, and then we're going to look at some, some famous people in history and even now, and we're going to look at some of their views regarding some of these topics. So we're going to look at, look at heaven first. What does some of Hollywood believe about heaven? I'm going to start off with Robin Williams. We know that Robin Williams, uh, he died tragically uh, last year, and he was asked the question, if heaven exists, what would you like God to say when you arrive at the pearly gates? His first answer is this. They're seating near the front. The concert begins at five. It'll be Mozart, Elvis, and then one of your choosing. This is his response. His second response, if heaven exists, to know that there is laughter just to hear God go, two Jews walked into a bar. Now listen, he thinks when he go to heaven that God's going to be in heaven telling jokes. No, God won't be in heaven telling jokes. Uh, he believes that, again, concerts are going to be going on and Mozart playing and, and Elvis playing. Elvis, Elvis didn't leave the building. He's going to be there playing. The world has some weird ideas about heaven. Look at this next one. Look at this next one. Uh, uh, Victor Hugo, he's a famous French poet and author. Listen to what he says about heaven and paradise. He said, sacrificing the earth for paradise is giving up substance for the shadow. He calls paradise or heaven a shadow. He goes on to say an intelligent hell would be better than a stupid paradise. Man, give me, give me a stupid paradise any day over an intelligent hell. Again, they don't understand. Uh, this is their understanding of these places, but they don't know what the Bible says about it. Let me give you another look at this one. Katy Perry. Katy Perry uh, has, a, has a Christian heritage that is rich. Her parents, they are godly people. They are itinerant pastors and preachers, and, and, and they pray for their daughter. But, but this young lady, listen to what she says. She said, I don't believe in, in a heaven or a hell or an old man sitting on, the, on a throne. I believe in a higher power bigger than me because that keeps me accountable. She said, I'm not Buddhist. I'm not Hindu. I'm not 
Christian, but I still feel uh, I have a deep connection with God. Listen, a deep connection with the God of this world, not the God of heaven. She's, she's turned her back on, on her Christian heritage. They got some weird, whenever you do that, you get weird views. Look at this next one. What about hell? What does Hollywood believe about hell? Now, this one really shook me and really, really hit my heart. So what I'm going to do, uh, how many know President Ronald Reagan? Uh, he was a great president. Not only that, but he was a great godly man as well. But he had a son, has a son. Uh, his son is Ron Reagan. Ron Reagan has uh, claimed to be a devout atheist. He don't believe in God. Well, I want you to listen to Ron Reagan in his own words in regards to hell. Listen at this. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. Oh, my God, what a statement. When I heard that, my heart dropped. I said, what? Not afraid to burn in here. This man's on my prayer list. Uh, I'm praying. I'm calling his name out before heaven. God, give this man an encounter with you. Because he don't realize, I mean, believe me, he, don't, he does not realize hell. You know, he said he's an atheist. You know, the Bible says the fool have said in his heart, there is no God. You know, God doesn't believe in atheists. Yeah, he doesn't. He don't believe in atheists. He doesn't. You know, when atheists go to hell, he believes in God, but it's too late. Listen, I would encourage you, put Ron Reagan on your prayer list. Call that man's name out before God. What about Mark Twain? Mark Twain said this. He said, go to heaven for the climate, go to hell for the company. I don't think so, man. I'm going to heaven all the way, man. I'm, I'm a heaven guy. Look at this next one. Al Franken, he, he was a part of Saturday Night Live. Now he's one of our U.S. senators. He said, I think hell exists on earth. It's a psychological state, or it can be a physical state. People who have severe mental illness are in hell. People who have lost a loved one are in hell. I think there are all kinds of different hells. It's not a place you go to after you die. Oh, yeah? The Bible is quite clear about hell. You know, again, Hollywood have all these weird ideas and weird views about eternity. Let's look at this last one, and the last view on the end of the world. What does Hollywood think about the end of the world? Look at this. How many, how many saw the movie and read the book, The Ender's Game? Well, this is the author, uh, Orson Scott Card. Listen to what he said. He said, you frighten me when you say there isn't time. I don't see why Christians have to have, have been expecting the imminent end of the world for millennia. He said, but it keeps not ending. He said, so far, so good. See, his mentality at the end of the world is doom and gloom. He said, why are Christians so excited about the end of the world? You people frighten me. Well, Orson Card does not understand the end of the story. And what's so beautiful, saints, God has so beautifully given us the end of the story in the scriptures. It is our job as believers to proclaim truth to this world, to let them know that, that again, God has all this thing under control, and God's future for the redeemed is going to be awesome. You know, I like making the world jealous about where we are going. I like to make the world jealous about, about our eternity with him. And again, we're going to see that this morning as we go forward. Look at this next one. The movie came out called The End. Is, uh, this is The End. Listen to what they say about the end of the world. They said, nothing ruins a party like the end of the world. And believe me, the end of the world will ruin your party. Again, this movie, again, it was a, it was a mockery against, against the gospel, against the word of God. And again, Hollywood, again, they don't believe in the end time. They believe that they have, have, uh, have all, all the time in the world, but there is an end coming. And again, if you're not ready for that end, that end will affect and change your eternity. And again, we're going to see that this morning. Now, 
what should be our response or what should our response be to the end of the world? As Christians, how should we respond to the end time message? You know, I meet some Christians that come to me, Brother Perkins, I'm so scared. I'm so afraid. I'm so anxious. I'm full of anxiety about the end time. Wars and rumors of wars, famines. Oh, oh. You know, listen, Christian, the end times should not make you panic. The end times should not make you anxious. It should not cause that kind of fear on you. If that's how you're relating to it, you're not understanding it properly. For the redeemed, our future with God is beautiful. These end times, even though they may be negative events, those negative events point to a positive, and we're going to see that uh, as we go forward. When we think of the end of the world, the majority of time we see it as a negative. But if we focus on the end times through the lens of God's prophetic word, we will get a different perspective, a clearer heavenly view of the last days. The scriptures give us some wonderful examples of how Christians should respond to the end times and the end of the world. So let me give you some of the responses that we should have to the end time. This first one, we know it very familiar. It's uh, found in Romans 13, verse 11. Paul wrote this. He says, and that knowing the time. See, we know we're living in the last days. How many would agree we're in the end times? How many would agree? Okay, we know that we're living in the end times and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Listen, our response should be that we're going to wake out of sleep. We're going to wake out of the cold, lethargic life. And we're going to believe the word of God. Listen, we are living in the end times. We should be the most alert of all people in the world because we realize that we've entered the end time season. What should our, our response be? Look at this one. Jesus gave us this, another familiar passage. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verse number 28. Jesus said, and when these things begin to come to pass, Jesus said, when you begin to see the signs of the times, wars and rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes in many places, pestilence, diseases, when you begin to see these things, when you begin to see these things, he said, then look up, Christian. He said, Christian, lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. For the Christian, the end time message, even though there are some negative events, those negative events should produce a positive in us. It should motivate us to reach a lost world for the kingdom of God. We should not be afraid. We should not shy back, shy away from the end time message. We need to embrace it and allow it to motivate us to reach the harvest. Here's another response. Look at this. Hebrews 10, 25. The writer wrote, he said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Because we see the day approaching, he said, don't forsake going to church. That's why you're here today. You're not forsaking your assembling together. But also because you see the day approaching, he said, we Christians should be exhorting one another. We should be encouraging other Christians to come we should encourage other Christians to stay with, stay with Christ. You know, you got friends and family members that are not near you right now. You have Christian friends that used to be here that are no longer with you. God laid you on, them, on your heart. You need to go and reach out to them. Where have you been, buddy? I haven't seen you in a while. You need to go and encourage them. You need to exhort them uh, uh, to stay with, stay with Christ and keep their hand on the plow. See, our response, because we understand the end times, should be different than the world's response. The world has no hope of the future. They have no hope. We have a hope that God has given, and our hope with him is beautiful. And again, I love it. I love it so much in the scriptures. Now, what is the meaning of Bible prophecy? What is this end time message all about? Uh, I want to start with a passage here. I love this passage so much. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 19 through 21, Peter wrote, he said, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Listen, this message of Bible prophecy is a sure word. It's a sure foundation. You can stand on what God says he's going to do for the future. Everything he says he's going to do, it will come to pass. It's a sure word. He said, whereunto you do well that you take heed. Christian, you need to take heed to the end time message. Don't let this message slip. A lot of times we let it slip because we're afraid of knowing the future. God wants you to know the future. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. Take heed to it. 
as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Peter said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecies came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God would come upon the prophets of old, Zechariah, Micah, uh, uh, Malachi. The Spirit of God would come upon these prophets and they would begin to write a, a, a panoramic view of the future. We live in an amazing time because we can see their prophecies, we can see what's coming to pass, and we can see what's coming in the future. These men wrote under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Listen, it's so amazing what we have uh, in our times today by looking at all of these end time events in prophecy. What is Bible prophecy? Bible prophecy signifies the speaking forth of the mind and counsel of God regarding the future. You know, Bible prophecy tells us exactly what God is going to do in the end of the world. You know, the psychics, I, I was watching news, watching TV the other day, and uh, now they got the California psychics commercials coming, coming online again. And these California psychics, they've given over a million prophecies or, or, or psychic readings, one dollar a minute. And people are, people are signing up, getting their, getting their, getting their, getting their future uh, read. But it's not, it's not the future from the word of God. Uh, scripture warns against going to the psychic. The Bible says you will defile your spirit by going to a psychic. The psychic can't give you the future. Only God can give you the future. Look what it says. Prophecy is not foretelling. It is the declaration of that which cannot be known by natural means. It's, it is the forth telling of the will of God regarding to the future. I love that. Bible prophecy is the forth telling of the will of God. You know, God says, I am God. There's no other God beside me. God says, I am God. I am God who will tell you the future at the beginning. God says, I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm going to do if you just spend time with me and my word. I'll show you. I'll tell you exactly what I have in store for you. Whether with reference to the past, the present, or the future. Bible prophecy, again, is the forth telling of the will of God. What is Bible prophecy? Bible prophecy is God's master plan to restore mankind to, uh, to the former glory that he lost uh, at Adam's fall in the garden. All future events in Bible prophecy point to our future with him, with God. There will soon be a day when all of God's prophetic word will, com will be completed and we will experience all that God has promised us. The study of the end times gives us insight into what is in store for those who choose to live for God. Listen, it is best to live for God. When you live for God, God has an exciting future for the redeemed. Now, if you choose not to live for God, uh, God also has an exciting judgment for rebels. And Bible prophecy is quite clear on that. You know, uh, uh, there's a payday for sin. If you choose to disobey and you choose uh, not to accept God's love advance, Jesus Christ, then there's a payday coming for those who choose not to serve him. Now, we're going to see some amazing things here. Uh, Dr. Chuck Mitchell in his book, Prophecy 2020, listen to what he says about Bible prophecy. I love this. He said, Bible prophecy is more than a simple uh, glimpse of what may, what may lie ahead. It is an overview of God's complete plan for mankind. I love that. It's an overview of God's complete plan. God is telling us exactly what's going to happen in the future. Man, I love it. And, I, and what I mean, what I've seen in the scriptures, I mean, it is going to be exciting for the redeemed. So what I'm going to do here in the, in the last part of this particular study, what we're going to do, I'm going to give you an overview. I'm going to bring the chart in and I'm going to give you an overview. I'm going to stir you. I'm going to remind you of some of the prophecies. But I'm going to show you again just this beautiful uh, overview of our future. God has a wonderful future for the redeemed. So we're going to start here. We'll bring the prophecy chart in. You see the first red circle there? Here we have Christ in prophecy, our Lord and Savior. I love this. Jesus went to Calvary. There were over 300 prophecies that led him to Calvary. Of the 300 prophecies, 108 of those prophecies were specific, minute, detailed prophecies. Prophecies like he would drink vinegar. They would give him vinegar to drink. They would pierce him in the side. 
He would ride into Jerusalem riding a donkey. He would be portrayed with 30 pieces of silver. He would come out of Bethlehem, Ephrata. I mean, minute, detailed prophecies in the scripture that led him to Calvary. And guess what, saints? He fulfilled those prophecies going to the cross. Let me tell you something. Those prophecies led Jesus to Calvary to give every one of us today eternal life. And I'm so glad. You know, when Peter tried to deliver Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter was getting out of divine order. And Jesus said, Peter, put your sword away. He touched the man's ear, gave him his ear back, and he said, let's go on and do what God has called us to do. Peter, Peter was trying to stop prophecy, but the prophetic word said, Jesus, he must go to the cross to redeem mankind. He fulfilled those prophecies. Now, there are other prophecies we're going to see in a few minutes that are still left on his life that he will come back to fulfill. But again, prophecy led Jesus to Calvary. Let's go back to the chart. And we're going to see the next circle. Here we have the church age, and then we have the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we are currently today in the church age, the dispensation of the church. Uh, the church age began in the book of Acts, chapters 1 through 22. And guess what, saints? We're still in the book of Acts today. Here, God is using the body of Christ to reach the world. Every one of us, God want to use us in some capacity in the church age to reach the world. Here, the body of Christ is at work in the earth. But guess what? This church age, this dispensation of the church is rapidly coming to an end. The Bible tells us the next major event on God's calendar is that event of the rapture where Christ is going to rapture the church. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. Christ is going to take us up. The church will be caught up, the Bible says. We're going to meet Jesus in the air. I love this rapture, saints. I love the rapture. I've taught it before here, but I love the rapture because this rapture is going to usher me into the presence of my Savior. I'm going to see Jesus face to face. Not only that, but this rapture will give me a glorified body. Philippians 3.20, Paul wrote, he says, he says that Jesus, he's going to change this vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. I'm longing for a glorified body. I'll be 56 my next birthday, man. I'm, I'm, I'm not as fast as I used to be. I can't run. I mean, I used to run like that. I, can't, I, I, gotta, I run, you know, a little smoother now, you know what I mean? It lets me know that, that I'm in a world that's, that's contaminated. I'm in a world that's dying. I'm longing for the day when I receive my glorified body. Oh, man, that body is going to be so beautiful. The Bible says, Scripture lets us know that the glorified body, once we receive that body, the sin nature will no longer be a part of our being. Those that are glorified at the time of the rapture, you will no longer have the war in your members of the flesh. The temptation will not be there ever again. We will be glorified with Christ. The Bible says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But the scripture goes on to tell us further that as we go to the rapture, we also go into another event called the great, uh, uh, the, the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, this is Romans chapter 14, verse 10, and 1 Corinthians 5, verse uh, 10 and 11. Here, the scripture predicts that Christians, every one of us that are born again, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. Every believer here no matter what, you, uh, uh, what capacity you're in, every one of us will give an account before Christ of our laborers as a believer. You know, if you're born again today, you are required to do works. The Apostle Paul said, Christian, he said, be careful that you maintain good works. If you're a Christian, you should have good works that testify that you're a Christian. You know, many Christians get saved and they sit on the pew and that's all they do. Brother Perkins, I'm, saved. I'm not saved by works as any man should boast. That's right. You're not saved by works, but after you're saved, Jesus is looking for you to do something. You know, many of us, we realize, you know, that God saved us, but we don't realize that he saved us with a purpose. Every one of us have something to do in the kingdom of God. You may not be a preacher. You may not be a pastor, but every one of us have something to do in the kingdom. And we need to ask God, God, what is my purpose Father, why did you save me? What, what, what do you want to do? What, how do you want to use me in my life, Lord? What can I do for the kingdom of God? Every one of us need to ask that question to God every day. The Bible talks about Christians standing for the judgment seat. Some Christians will receive rewards. Some Christians will lose rewards. The scripture says that our works are either good works or our works will become worthless works. But one thing about the judgment seat, even though Christians may lose rewards, Christians will still be saved at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is a wonderful event for, for, for the believers only. Only Christians will be at the judgment seat of Christ. 
Now let's go back to the chart, and I'm going to take it back down to earth. See the next circle here? We have the Great Tribulation. This is the time the Bible talks about. Jesus said the tribulation will, will be a time this world has never seen nor never ever will see again. We find the tribulation beginning in the book of Revelation chapter 6 through chapters 19. 21 judgments will enter the great tribulation. Now, I must admit the tribulation will be a rough ride for those that are part of it. But the church will be delivered from this event. The main purpose of the tribulation, the, the, the end result of the great tribulation is that salvation will come to the house of Israel. But the tribulation will affect the whole world. 21 judgments, seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, and seven vile judgments will enter the earth. God is going to judge man. God, Father God, is going to judge rebels. Not only 21 judgments, but mankind will also have to deal with the Antichrist, the man of sin. Daniel 11, 11 36 to 45 tells us that the Antichrist will be a self-willed king. Uh, the Bible says he will not honor the God of his fathers. He will only honor the God of munitions or the God of war. The Bible says that the Antichrist, uh, he will wear out the saints. Any person who is born again in the tribulation, the Bible says the Antichrist will wear you out. Anybody who's saved in the tribulation, they may become a martyr in the tribulation. It's a whole different dispensation, whole different world for those who find themselves in the tribulation. Not only do they have 21 judgments, not only do they have the Antichrist, but they also have to deal with the Antichrist economy, his system, this mark of the beast system. Men will not be able to buy or sell during the tribulation unless they have the identified mark in the right hand or in the forehead or if they worship Antichrist. Listen, it's going to be a different dispensation, a different time, but the Bible gives it to us. But I'm so grateful, saints, because God, Father God, puts a time limit on it. It's going to only last for seven years. And God's going to judge this time uh, of, 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 of rebels, men who have come against God. He's going to judge them. The Antichrist will be judged at the end of this thing. It's going to be amazing. Now, let's go back up to the chart again. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you back up to the heavens. And I'm going to show you another event that will transpire. We'll see the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll see the second coming of Christ, and then we'll come down and see the battle of Armageddon. Now, again, I love this. I mentioned before that when uh, we're in heaven, after we attend the, uh, the judgment seat of Christ, the Bible lets us know that we will be a part of a great banquet spread in heaven. Uh, the Bible says, blessed are those who are part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, verses 7 through 10. Here, this would be a banquet spread in heaven only for the redeemed. You know, no sinners will appear at the, judgment, at the, at the uh, marriage supper. And have you heard me say, I mentioned before that uh, uh, I was real excited when I found that there'd be food in heaven. I mean, I just, that just thrilled me. You know, something about that just made me happy. Uh, I've said many times as well, I don't care where I am as long as I'm at that table. But it's only for the redeemed. If you're born again, you'll be invited to that great banquet spread in heaven. Man, what a banquet to be there with our Lord. I'm looking forward to that. But the Bible goes on to tell us that uh, after this event, that, that uh, the Bible talks about our Savior, Jesus Christ. He will come back in the second coming. This is Christ coming back to planet Earth to fulfill more prophecy. But he's coming back to, to deal with the Antichrist. He's coming back to bring an end to the time of the seven-year tribulation. He's coming back to judge the Antichrist. He's coming back to bind Satan at this time. He's coming back, the Bible says, as a man of war. But not only is Christ coming, but he's coming back with the saints. That's going to be us riding those white horses coming with Christ. Not only us, but also the angels of heaven. We are coming back with Christ because Jesus, in the second coming, he's coming back at that time to take authority in the earth. He's coming to take authority. He's coming to, to take rule over planet earth. It's going to be a theocratic government, meaning it will be a government ruled by God. It's going to be awesome, saints. This world will finally experience a peaceful government. Christ will be ruling at the helm, but he's going to come back first to take authority. And I'm telling you, saying, this is going to be a time, the Bible says, at the second coming of Christ, Revelation 1, verse 7, that when Christ come back, that the world is going to mourn at this return. The reason why, because Jesus is coming back with fire in his eyes. The world never saw him like that. He's coming back as a judge 
to judge those rebels who formed an alliance with Antichrist, he's coming back to get them. As a result of the second coming, the Bible tells us in Revelation 19, verse 17 through 21, the Bible talks about a great event called the Battle of Armageddon. This battle will be a battle like none others. Uh, I must say, though, this battle will be a one-sided battle because we already know, saints, that Jesus is going to win this battle. But what's going to happen in the second coming of Christ, give a clap, that's so good. Jesus already won this battle. In the second coming, the second coming will, will produce the battle of Armageddon. The Bible says that blood will come up to the horse's bridle. God's going to judge Antichrist. Jesus will judge Antichrist. At this time, the Antichrist and false prophet will be taken from the Armageddon theater and they will be cast, the Bible says, alive into the lake of fire. You know, the Bible says that the valley of Megiddo is going to be like a big old wine vat and Jesus will tread the grapes of the unredeemed, the evil, uh, those wicked men that have formed alliance with Antichrist. They're going to be gathered in the Valley of Megiddo, and Jesus is going to smash them like smashing grapes. He's going to judge rebels, but he's coming back to take authority in the earth. He's coming back with purpose, and that purpose is to set up his government. And I love it, man. I love it so much because we, the saints, will be a part of that government. It's going to be beautiful. Let's go back to the chart. I'm going to take you a little bit further here. And now you see this next circle. This circle is, is, the, is, the, is the millennial kingdom of Christ or the thousand-year reign of Jesus. Revelation chapter uh, 20, uh, verses 1 on down, uh, one, 1 through verse, uh, verse 9, uh, verse 10. And also Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Uh, Isaiah 9 says that the government will be on his shoulders. Jesus, our Savior, is coming back to be the true Lord. The Bible says in Zechariah that he will be king of the earth. And guess what? The, the Bible says the nations will come before him and they will honor and worship him as king. The scripture says that we, the saints that are glorified, we will reign with Christ. We will be all over the world to help Christ govern the world. I'm looking forward to that. You know, this millennial kingdom will be a, a precursor or a foretaste of what eternity is going to look like. Man, I love this. This It's going to be beautiful. Peace, the prince of peace will be on planet Earth, and the Earth will experience peace like none other. The Bible says the weapons of war shall be made instruments of, of, of digging and, and, and farming. Those, plow, uh, th those instruments of war will become plowshares. Uh, there'll be no killing, he said, in this holy mountain. Another thing about this millennium I love so much. Look at this next one. I love this one. God's going to change the nature of the beast. The Bible says a little child will leave these animals and won't be harmed. The scripture says in Isaiah that a little child, he will put his hand on a most poisonous snake's den and the snake will not harm him. The Bible says a child will leave them. The scripture says the lion, Leo the lion, will eat straw like the ox. You know, it amazed me today I meet people who believe we're in the millennium. I said, man, let me take you to San Diego Zoo. I'm, we're going to see about that. Get you some hay and throw that hay in that lion's den and see what he's going to do. He's going to lay on it as a bed. The Bible says that the, that the wolf and the lamb will lie together. You do it today, you got lamb chops. <laughs> We're not in the millennium yet, but I'm telling you, saying what's coming, what God, what the word of God has predicted, what the word of God has given us in a future, is going to be awesome. God's going to take the, the beast, the nature of the beast, out of the beast. The lion will not even want flesh in the millennial kingdom. This is just a foretaste of what eternity is going to look like. God's going to allow man to have dominion again over all of the animals. Yeah, man, our future is awesome. You know, it's, 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 it's beautiful to stay with God. You know, the Bible says that the present sufferings of this world are not even worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed. Listen, man, our future with God is going to be awesome, and it's best to stay with God. You know, another thing about the millennium I love, the Bible says that, that men will live as long as a tree. Some, some people live the entire thousand years without dying in the millennium. They will live as long as a tree. This is going to be awesome. It's a, it's a, pre, uh, it's, it's a foretaste of eternity, this millennial reign. And another thing, too, uh, Satan will be bound during this time, so Satan will not be able to tempt men in the millennial kingdom. Man, our future is going to be awesome. Now, let's go a little bit further. I'm going to take you back up to the heavens, and then I'm going to bring you down to the lower part of the chart. But we're going to see the great white throne and the reality of hell. 
Now, the great white throne, Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15, uh, this is one of those messages to me that stirs my heart up for the harvest. Again, here, God is showing mankind that there's coming a day that he's going to judge those people who have rejected him. There's coming a day when men will give an account for their rejection of God. Men will give an account. I pray for Ron Reagan. Ron Reagan is on my prayer list. He's on, he's on my target list. I'm calling his name out before heaven. Lord, save Ron Reagan. You know, Ron Reagan reminds me of Apostle Paul. He was on assignment, you know, to kill Christians until he bumped into Jesus. I'm going to pray that Ron Reagan have a Damascus experience. Yeah, I'm going to pray for Ron Reagan. I'm going to believe, let's call him Ron Reagan. Save Ron Reagan. I'm going to make bumper stickers. Save Ron Reagan, man. I'm serious, man. I, I, I'm believing God for this man's soul. Because let me tell you something, saints. If Ron Reagan don't come to Christ, he's going to stand before the white throne judgment and give an account for his rejection of God. And guess what? Everyone that's here at the white throne, they will be eternally damned. Not a one of them will be saved. Every one of them will be assigned forever into the lake of fire. There's coming a day he's going to wish that he accepted Christ because those that uh, are judged, that every one of them will go to the lake of fire, the Bible says. Revelation 20.10 talks, talks about Satan being cast there, and, and, and 21.8 talks about, uh, it gives a list of people who goes to hell. But everyone who has rejected Christ, everyone who has not accepted God uh, as their God, they will go to hell. It's a reality, and we need to understand it. I mentioned in the first service, I preached in Tulsa, and I met, a, I met a correctional officer. This guy, he told me, Brother Perkins, my job is to, uh, uh, I'm the man that spend time with prisoners on death row before they die. And he said, uh, one thing about my job, he said, God put me there. And he said, I have a chance to, to meet their accommodations. I try to do whatever they need to be happy before they go to die. And he said, as a preacher, as a minister, or as a, as a child of God, I have a chance to minister the gospel to them. He said, and I share with them, listen, man, you're about, you about to go into eternity, man. You need to get your affairs right with God. He said, some accept Christ, but many of them, even on their deathbed, they reject Christ. And he told me a story. He said, I remember one time this one man, I ministered to this guy. And this guy said, I don't want Jesus. He rejected Christ. And he said, Brother Perkins, as this man was dying, he said, as this man was dying, all of a sudden he screamed out, my feet are burning, my feet are burning. And then he slipped into eternity. He said, Brother Perkins, he said, it was, it was so real. My feet are burning, my feet are burning. And he slipped into eternity. This man died. Let me tell you something, this thing is real. This is, this is no joke. This is a reality. People are dying every day. Atheists are dying every day. And they're realizing that hell is a reality. Jesus died on the cross to give us eternal life. This thing is real. And this must be the message that every believer gives to a dying world. Listen, man, Jesus died so you want to go to hell. You know, sometimes we're afraid to tell our, our family members about hell. You need to tell your family members about hell. Now, some of them, it takes love. Jude said, some with love and compassion making a difference. But others, Jude said, with fear making a difference. You know what I got saved? I got saved because of the fear of God. I was one of them sinners that was, that was called a knucklehead. Yeah, it, it, didn't, it wasn't the love of God that drew me. It was the fear of hell that drew Brother Perkins because I enjoy sin too much. And, you know, you have families out there that love sin. They love it. So they need a reality of hell. Now, some of them, it just take a, a simple message that God loved them, and they may come in gracefully to Christ. But them knuckleheads, they need a hard word. Ron Reagan is a knucklehead. He need, he, need a, he need a reality of hell. Lord, save Ron Reagan. Now, I'm not going to leave you in hell, saints. We're going to end this with this beautiful, beautiful eternity for the redeemed. The Bible talks about our future with God. You know, I read the verse earlier in Peter, 2 Peter, where he said that, that the elements will melt in fervent heat. He said, but nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Listen, saints, our eternity with God is going to be awesome. It's going to be beautiful. I want to say to you today, hang in there. I don't care what you're going through. Don't give up on God. Don't turn back on God. Listen, it is better for you to stay with God because the end of this thing is going, it's going to pay much dividends for your faithfulness to God. 
The Bible says that this world we're living in is going to go through a fire baptism. It's going to go through a transformation. All the elements of this world, all those things that, that contaminated this world, God's going to renovate it. And when we step into the new world, the Bible says it's going to be a world without sin, without death, without sorrow, without the devil, without Tylenol, without, mo uh, uh, I mean, all those, all those medicines. You know, you can't even watch TV today with all the medicines. I mean, they're telling you uh, how this medicine is going to help you, but then the next 50 lines of the thing, they're telling you how much it's going to hurt you. I said, I'm going to keep what I got, man. I, I, mean, I mean, what you want to give me is a whole lot worse. Listen, we need Jesus, man. We need the eternal world that God has prepared for us. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yes, this is our eternity. The Bible tells us that this new Jerusalem, Revelation chapter 21 and 22, Revelation, this, this prophecy reveals that the new Jerusalem is going to come out of heaven upon the new earth. God's tabernacle, God's house. Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions, are many dwelling places. Our dwelling place is going to be in the new Jerusalem, man. I'm looking forward, man. I'm going to my place that my Savior prepared for me for all eternity. The Bible said this city will come down. It has 12 manner of precious stones, the foundation. It has 12 pearly gates. The gates never close. The Bible said we'll be, we'll be able to go in and out of the city. At the heart of the city, the Bible says, Father God and the Lamb will reside in the city. The scripture said that the city will have the tree of life and it's going to bear 12 manner of fruits and yield a different fruit every month. Man, I'm going to be there. The Bible says, the, the, Bible says the, the living water, pure living water of life will proceed out of the throne of God going throughout the whole world. Man, it's going to be awesome. Listen, it is better to stay with God. Our eternity with him is going to be beautiful. It's beautiful. The Bible says the New Jerusalem, this picture, I love this picture, but it really doesn't, doesn't do justice. This, this, this New Jerusalem will be awesome. Uh, we'll be able to go into this city. The glory of God will light the city. And it's going to be a blessing for those that are born again. Listen, it is best to stay with God. It is better to, to, to give your life to Christ if you're not saved today. It is better to do it God's way than to be a knucklehead. It is better to yield to God because the end is going to be beautiful. You know what keeps me straight and strong in the kingdom of God? Knowing the future, knowing what God has prepared for me. You know, the present sufferings I go through, it can't even compare to what God has revealed. I'm looking forward to my time with him. Now listen, saints, it doesn't mean that I'm, a, I'm so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good. You know, because I understand the end time, it makes me a better uh, human. It makes me a better, more productive citizen here. You know, I have more of a heart for humanity and I reach out to the lost because I see them with God's eyes. Every one of us, we need to see this. We need to, we need to have an eternal perspective. I have a message entitled, Living in the Light of Eternal Judgment. Living in the Light of Eternal Perspective. You know, if you have an eternal perspective, you live a different life. I can tell when Christians don't know the future by the way they live. They live their life sloppy. Uh, I call it sloppy agape. You know, greasy grace, greasy grace. You don't want no greasy grace. No, no, no. You want to live the grace of God that's going to teach you to deny, to deny ungodliness and to live soberly and righteously in this present world. Yeah. When you, when you understand the end of the story, you live a different life as a Christian. And again, this is our future. This is the end of the story. The end of the story for the redeemed is going to be beautiful. And every one of us here that are born again will be a part of that eternity. And again, saints, I love it. I'm so glad Jesus died for me. I'm so glad. You know, I'm thinking today, God, I, I thank you for dying for me. Lord, what have you in store? God, I mean, just what you've given us is overwhelming. And when we literally step into that eternity, how awesome it's going to be. You know, my mind goes back to what that man told me about that young man who rejected his, uh, uh, his, his uh, word about receiving Christ. And as, and as this man was dying, his feet was burning because his spirit and soul was slipping into hell. I think about it, that man has no, no more chance, but we do, you do. Every one of us, God want to use us in some capacity to reach a dying world. 